Alrighty, let's see. A return of Solo. I mentioned in my last Final Fantasy report that I was going to take a look at the forgotten SNES game next, the overlooked Final Fantasy V. The key feature of this game is its intricate chop system, whereby your four characters can switch back and forth between 22 different chops or classes and learn abilities from each of them. By mixing and matching the abilities of different shops, you can put together extremely powerful combinations. For example, if you level up a character as a knight and a white mage, you can combine them and create a knight that can also cast white magic, and the combinations only get more exotic from there. How about a dancing ninja, a summoning berserker, a samurai chemist? Yeah, it can get pretty crazy, although summoning berserker is not unlikely. Berserkring Summoner, that works. <laughs> Certain combos are definitely stronger than others, but there's nearly infinite replayability by doing these things a different way and finding alternate paths to victory. As T-Hawk predicted at Realms Beyond, Final Fantasy V is a game made for variants. The one knock on this game is that it has a poor story, and that the characters aren't well developed or interesting. That's certainly true. The plot is as generic and cliched as you'll ever see, and there's not much personality amongst the four characters. Still, my, re my response to this criticism would be that as the simple statement, if you're looking for a good story, why are you playing a video game? The whole point of having complex storylines and interesting characters in RPGs is to provide some relief from the otherwise tedious grind fest. I disagree. Whatever. But in Final Fantasy V, there is no slumber inducing writing. Your story is the gameplay. I agree with that one. That is, you create the plot yourself by defining which jobs you assign to each character. This game simply doesn't deserve the maligning it often takes online, because it actually requires you to use some imagination and flesh out the personalities yourself. Heaven forbid gamers do that. I played through the game once, on a non-variant run, to fami familiarize myself with the gameplay engine and learn about the individual weapons slash spells, and did where to find to everything. Huh? Uh, to learn about what individual weapons and spells did and where to find everything. Final Fantasy V is a pretty big game, certainly much bigger than the original Final Fantasy. And there was a lot of pickup. I know the first practically by heart after all these years, and it's a very big difference between knowing instinctively where the boss's weakness are and having to flip back and forth online guides for some in information. Fortunately, there's a fabulous FAQ written by JL Zeng detailing every single calculation that takes place in the game. You c could call it the Charles Guide of Final Fantasy V. And I don't use that term lightly. By the time I completed that run and annihilated the final boss with my awesome team of superpower Deathbringers, I was ready to start a variant run of some kind. For my first such game, I decided I would return to my original Final Fantasy variant and reprise the solo Black Belt. Of course, the Black Belt class itself is gone, but the monk job is nearly identical. The monk fights barehanded, equips only light armor, and has a high rate of critical hits. And see damage incre increased based on adding more levels rather than finding better weapons. The game mechanics are literally almost identical. In other words, this variant means swapping immediately to the monk job and never switching to any other class, playing the game out in true black belt fashion. Time for solo to embark on a new quest to conquer the world with the power of bare fists. Two quick notes on the game itself. I am playing an emulated version of the Super Famicom game, using the excellent translation provided by RPGE. As such, I'll be using their translation for all of the characters slash monster slash item names, even butts, which is kinda silly. Although I vastly prefer Kara to the name Kryl that they used in the PlayStation translation. Secondly, while you could technically use any character for a solo challenge, both Lena and Galof drop out of your, of your party for non-trivial lengths of time. Between Butts and Ferris, 
I went with the former since he looked closer to the original Black Bell character design. But it's also the only character in the game you have the option of renaming, so I went ahead and rebranded him solo. And off we go. First things first. Kill off the other three characters and get to work fighting alone. This picture was taken in the first cave before you even meet up with Ferris and her crew. Solo hasn't gotten the monk job yet either. You pick up the, your first six jobs very early on, but not immediately. For the moment he was using the default bear class, which can equip all weapons and armor, but has no abilities whatsoever. I'll skip over the early uninteresting plot details. Solo met up with the th other three characters, made his way to the wind shrine, and fought the first boss, the wind raptor. The big bird, this game's version of Garland, took a while to take down when fighting with only one character. I had plenty of potions though, which made it easy. I also realized towards the end of the battle that I should move up to the front row, since all of the boss wind damage was magical and that vastly increased Solo's attack. At the top of the wind shrine, Solo gained access to the first six shops and began channeling the power of the monk. And greetings guy, hope you're doing well as well. Let me explain a little more about this class, since it's the only one we are going to be dealing with in this report. The monk has the highest base strength and vitality stats of the game, meaning a lot of physical damage and the best hit options growth of any job. It also has the lowest magic power stat of any class and thus the least magic point growth. Totally ir irrelevant for this variant though, since Solo will never learn or cast magic. The monk will always get two hits, one for each fist and damage increases as level goes up. More on that in a little bit. There are two other aspects of the monk job worth mentioning. The first is the option to use, an, to use a kick attack, which works exactly as the same as Yang's move from Final Fantasy 2 slash 4. The kick deals weak-ish damage to all enemies, occasionally useful in some situations. The monk also has the innate ability called Counter, which you could add to your characters in Final Fantasy 3 slash 6 and 7 with Relics or Materia. The, the Counter ability gives the monk a 50% chance to counter attack automatically whenever he takes physical damage. In some situations the best strategy is to do nothing but defend and rely on counter to defeat the enemies. The monk also has two other situational skills. Build up and mantra which I'll discuss later as they become more useful. I just saw that miss. I'm pretty sure those were five hits so far wasn't it? <laughs> oh dear. Anyway, after the tiny wind shrine dungeon, Solo returned to the nearest town of Tuo. I sold off all the starting weapons, useless now, and spent all the gold saved up so far on potions. Ended up with about two dozen for the next area, that could, would be the Torna Canal, a very short dungeon that you could actually sail through on the boat, ending with a boss fight against a crab-like creature called Car Car Carla Boss. This was the first fight where Solo got wiped out, as Carlobos had melee attacks that could stun him into helplessness. Give me a second. Alrighty. So yeah, that was a really close one. How much damage did we do, guys? That was two misses? <laughs> ah, oh well. So yeah, Carla Boss can stun. That's pretty unfortunate. Nasty stuff. This was the beginning of Solo's lengthy tra tra travails against bosses who could inflict deadly status ailments. The first time I tried to fight the fight, Solo never even got to issue a command, just got stunned over and over again while being slowly beaten to death. Carla Boss also had an attack called Tailscrew that it rarely used, which fun functions like a weak spell dropping hit points below 10, no matter where they started. The only healing option available to Solo was potions, which cured 50 hit points. That wasn't enough. 
I decided I needed to concentrate on offense and getting in enough damage to kill Karl Boss, 650 HP, before he had the time to whittle down Sol. Moved him to the front row and had much better results. The attacks increasing in damage from 20 with each fist to 60 or so. About 120 per attack total. On the third try, Solo got in a bunch of counterattacks and avoided getting stunned, leading to victory. He was level 9 at the time. Solo gained a more excellent experience in the next area, the ship graveyard. He picked up a huge increase in damage at level 10, for reasons I'll explain in a minute. Gained a couple more levels against the relatively easy undead opponents, leading up to another boss battle with the Siren. I had forgotten where this boss gets triggered and entered it the first time with Solo not at full hit points in the wrong role and without any clear idea of what my strategy was going to be. You can guess how that turned out. Siren swaps back and forth between two forms. A human form that casts magic and an undent form that attacks. She has quite a few spells in the human form which cause a serious variation in how the fight plays out. For example, the first battle I tried saw me get hit with sleep, which is really bad for a solo character. Once again, the superior strategy seemed to be starting in the front row, then swapping in the back row when Siren went over to her undead form to cut, cut down on the physical damage. Magical damage is independent of role, so better to be in the front when she ca is casting spells. My second try, Siren led off with Mute, totally useless. That's where I snapped the buff picture. Next round, she cast cures, similarly pointless since Siren healed back 60 damage and Solo inflicted 200 plus. She used Bolt on the third round, while Solo banged out more damage. At this point, I gave up on the notion of switching roles and kept beating a whale while she changed forms. It was over in 5 total rounds of combat. Siren has only 800 hit points. Less than 5% of the way into the game and I've already killed three different bosses. If there's one thing Final Fantasy is lacking, it isn't bosses. They're everywhere, compared to the original game, which has about a dozen on the whole. Garland, Wizard, Astos, Four Fiends, Twi and times two, and Chaos. You see how many more potential roadblocks there are in this game. Why do front and back rows make such a difference in damage? Time to pull out some formulas to explain how damage is calculated in this. If this doesn't interest you, just skip ahead a few paragraphs. Adding to JL Zeng's guide, the formula is as follows for fist damage. Alright, let me bring something real quick. Alright, the formula goes as follows. Attack type is X, that's 30 for fists. Then we have the hit percentage, that's 100 for the fists. Evade percentage is target evade. So it depends on which enemy or how much evasion the enemy has for the evasion. Follow hit determination for physical attacks steps uh, 6, 2 and 1. Use fist damage parameters 6, 4 and 6. So we have attack that is equal 3 plus uh, level divided by 4. And then we have M. Don't know what M is 2, that's 2. Then we have defense equals defense of the opponent. If the attacker has brawl, attack equals 3 plus level times 2 plus whatever uh, level you have divided by. Uh, multiplied by 2 divided by 8. And then we have level is defense, like equals defense. I guess the main difference is that M isn't strictly to whatever M does display. So oh, if the attacker has Kaiser Knuckles and Brawl, attack equals attack plus 50. Apply row modifiers to M652, whatever that means. Apply command modifier. I have no idea what those things mean. 
Max damage is 9,999. Oh, I should have just read what he wrote there instead of trying to interpret this myself. <laughs> Oopsie. I've never read this before, by the way. Let's break this down into smaller steps, because it's actually not very complicated at all. We'll start by assuming the attack and hits and skip the hit slash miss calculation before in steps 1 and 2. For the base damage number, we use the middle section as monks by definition always have the brawl ability. The attack value is equal to 3 plus level times 2 and random number between 0 and and level 1 times 2 divided by 8 in practical terms. Attack is pretty much 3 plus level times 2. At level 12, most solo attacks do base damage of 3 plus 12 times 2, that equals 27 damage. Defense is also simple to calculate, as it is simply the defense stat for each monster. You can pull this right out of online FAQs, so far so good. The interesting part is calculating the multiplier number, which then conveniently labels as M. Oh, that's right. If you look again at the middle section, the base calculation for M is level time strength divided by 256 plus 2. Where, where the Final Fantasy V guys came up with this formula, I have no idea. But in practice, it works really well. Let me give you a current example. Solo was level 12 at this point in time, with the default monk strength value of 54. His multiplier therefore was 12 times 54 divided by 256, that equals a uh, plus 2, that equals 2.53 plus 2, that is 4.53 total. An important note, Final Fantasy V uses it in Tetra math and always rounds down, truncates the calculation. So in our above calculation, the multiplier would round down to 4. The final calculation is then extremely simple as seen in steps 9 above. Attack minus defense times M. Against an enemy with 0 defense, so Solo would do 27 minus 0 times 4 equals 108 damage, which was indeed what I was seeing. The other steps 4 through 8 deal with modifiers for unusual commands, status effects and critical hits, which we can ignore for normal play. I do want to mention the row modifier step 4, however. Because of the huge effect it had on Solo, any character in the back row has their damage cut in half, a straight M, M divided by 2 on the multiplier. Why is this such a big deal? Remember, again, that Final Fantasy V uses integer math. Let's say that Solo had a multiplier of 3. Under normal conditions in the back row, that would become 3 divided by 2 equals 1.5 which becomes 1 after rounding down. Solo would be doing not double, but triple the damage in the front row under those circumstances. Now you might be inclined to just stay in the front row all the time, given that math. But you'd be overlooking something critical. The math works both ways, and the same limitations apply to the monster values of M. Thus, you do slightly more than double damage in the front row most of the time, and take slightly less than half of the damage in the back row. The best place to be therefore depends heavily on the situation. Both have their uses at times. Anyway, getting back on subject, Solo picked up a slightly improved armor in the next town of Carven. Nothing worth writing home about though. The main thing I did there was load up on potions. I did a little extra fighting outside the town until Solo had enough gold to buy 99 of them. Marsh Cave all over again. <laughs> Took Solo up another level in the process to level 13. The following enemy area was North Mountain, which presented another boss battle about three quarters of the way through. The fight starts against a magic using woman named Magisa, who calls in her husband Forza once she is near death. Knowing I would be facing magic attacks again, I had Solo in the front row to start the battle. He pummeled Magisa pretty good but she got in a nasty rain spell and that did almost 200 damage before biting it. Solo had 450 points total, ouch. Once the wo woman was gone, I shifted Solo into the back row against the melee exclusive Forza. Solo was near death, forcing me to use a potion each round of combat. 
Borsa would attack and do 40 to 60 damage. Then Solo would respond by healing exactly 50 hit points back. And thanks to counter, Solo would strike back 50% of the time hit. Love when that innate ab you love that innate ability. We repeat this stance for over a dozen rounds until the brute finally dropped dead. Victory! Won on the first try by having been the right strategy ahead of time. Should have grabbed the picture though to break up the wordy text of this report. The next was called Vorus, where the water crystal tower resided. There was another improved armor there for Solo, the training suit which boosted defense and also increased the strength by one point. Remember, strength and level are the two things that get factored into the multiplier calculations, so even a single point of extra there was noteworthy. Stats never increase by leveling in this game, by the way, just the hit points and matchy points. After another very short dungeon, Solo was facing off against another boss. Galdura. The thing called Galdura uses nothing but physical attacks. So this was a total slugfest. I put Solo in the back row to minimize damage, which cuts his own damage down to a little over 100 damage per two fisted round. That might not have been the best decision, because Solo was getting 5 times multiplayer in the front row and only 2 times in the back. It ended up working regardless. Thanks to a lot of successful counters and several critical hits, Solo squeaked past this with less than 100 hit points left. Another tight victory. Another village, another dungeon to follow. This is the pattern for basically every RPG. It's just a little more noticeable here because the early areas are so short in Final Fantasy V. Karnak's house, the fire crystal, and so understandably a lot of terra here had a lots of little fires burning on them. Solo gained enough ability points to open up the mantra command, which heals back some damage when used in combat. Even better, it uses no magic points. Too bad that it's only useful in the early part of the game, due to its weak curative properties. The problem here is actually not mantra itself, but the distress the disastrously low magic power the stat possessed by the monk. Mantra's healing power is halfway between Cure and Cure, wo uh, cure 1 and Cure 2. For the moment, however, it was nearly an uber ability. Sola could only heal back 50 hit points with potions, and Mantra would cure twice that at no cost. Uh, the best strategy for random battles was therefore to sit in the back row, making no attempt to attack and use Mantra constantly. When the enemies did damage to Solo, he would use counter and strike back at them without me doing a thing. This was a real lifesaver on potions and made this dungeon the steamship a breeze. The new noteworthy item, Solo turned up the green bearer in one of the chests, which increases all his defensive stats and also added one point of strength and agility. That was a major find, given how the multiplier M works with the strength. By the time Solo finished this area, he was up to level 19, where he reached the 6x multiplier in the fr front row, and the 3 times multiplier in the back row. Interestingly, just like the Black Belt, the Monk version of Solo is also getting jumps in damage increase, although definitely to a lesser degree. This brought Solo to the first truly interesting boss in the game, Liquid Flame. She, yes, it's actually one a woman under there, uses almost entirely fire-based attacks, so I placed a solo in the front row again. Liquid Flame switches back and forth between three different forms, each with different attack patterns. A human form, pictured above, a flame tornado, and a fiery hand. The human form would either attack good or cast flame, which was bad. The tornado form would cast fire too on itself endlessly, which would be absorbed and heal damage. The hand form simply attacked Solo over and over again. Liquid Flame would change back and forth between these forms in response to Solo attacks on her. Now, what was the best way to do this battle? 
I was unsuccessful in my first attempt on, at the boss, trying to figure out the attack patterns. I was doing little more than attacking with Solo, and she responded by roasting him with 5 attacks that were too damaging to heal. I probably could have won the battle by using some of my elixirs, but couldn't get one off in time and died. Hmm. That still seemed suboptimal. On the second try, I made the discovery that Liquid Flames wouldn't wouldn't change form unless Solo attacked her. After more experimentation, I found the solution. The best way to do the fight was to get her into the hand form and then simply defend using Mantra every round to keep the hit points up and rely on counters to deal damage. Remember, all of the attacks in that form were physical, which is what I wanted. Solo di still did have to deal with an annoying fingertip attack which caused instant paralysis for two rounds, and long sequence of fingertips attacks forced me to use a high potion, 500 hit points recovered, that I had found earlier. In the end though, it was no contest, another victory won not through brute force, uh, not through brute strength, but by having a plan. After taking out Liquid Flame, the game serves up an interesting challenge. You have 10 minutes to get out of Karma Castle before it explodes. The timed events were also present in Final Fantasy 3 6 and Final Fantasy 7 for those who have played them. There are lots of treasures to grab before leaving, including a bunch of elixirs and a nice accessory called the Elf Cape, which grants one third chance to dodge physical attacks. At the exit of the castle is a boss called Iron Claw. Well, the first time I did this, the solo grabbed all the treasure and made it out perfectly, only to have Iron Claw use his special attack, Death Claw, which paralyzed Solo and left him with one hit point remaining. Uh, talk about cheap. I swear, this game is ridiculously punishing if you don't know what you're doing. Fortunately, there was an easy solution to this situation. Kill Iron Claw first, first rather than last, in the boss fight and he won't use the super attack, then finish off his accompanying goons afterwards. Final Fantasy V is so old school, it's almost painful at times. There's nearly always a solution to every problem, but you're going to get your ass kicked until you discover what it is. Okay, on to the next box of interest, which in Final Fantasy is a library. Good at gift and credit for trying something a little different. You can get Ifrit summoning spell here by defeating the Esper in battle, but I plan to skip the optional fight since it would be useless for solo. I start moving through the dungeon. Hmm. Can't seem to get past this bookshelf that blocks my path. I don't remember running into this roadblock on my first playthrough. Why can't I get past now? Unless... Unless that Ifrit fight isn't so optional after all. Darn it. Now Solo had to deal with a boss that can torch himself with fire attacks. Again. I calculated using the damage formula that it would take about 8 rounds of combat to fight through Ifrit's 3000 hit points. The problem was that Ifrit's flame spell did roughly 250 damage on average, and Solo only had 850 hit points. Um, that was going to be... That wasn't going to be enough, and I didn't want to go through the stash of elixirs unless absolutely necessary. After several failed attempts, I decided to grind out three additional levels, from 21 to 24, where Solo would pick up an additional attack multiplier, 7 in the front row. Each level also added the base damage too, and piled on more damage hit points, or more total hit points. After reaching the new milestone, I moved Solo up to the front row and started banging away. I had to use one high potion and one elixir, but got it done in the second try. Another roadblock out of the way. Would have liked to do it without an elixir. Solo had 10 more in the sash safe, but that had been much more grinding already. Oh, that had been too much grinding already. The final boss of the library was Byblos, the second really interesting fight. Liquid Flame being the first. Why is this guy hard? He 
has all sorts of nasty buffs and debuffs to wreak havoc on a solo character. If attacked with physical damage, Bible's responds by casting armor, which cuts physical damage in half. Actually, the spell cuts modifier M by half M2, so it's so it actually reduces damage by more than 50% in many situations. If hit by magic, he responds by casting frog. When Byblos gets low on hit points, he begins casting drain over and over again, healing himself while hurting the party. That's a brick wall for all sorts of low damage variants right there. Byblos also has a very strong physical attack, 30 base damage and a multiplier of 15. And even more nasty status effect spells, Slow, Charm and Sonic Wave, which cuts level by half. There are all sorts of bad things that can happen in a fight against this guy. Needless to say, Solo got absolutely trashed in my first attempt against this boss. I started thinking about some possible, possible boss busting strategies and decided to break out the monk's build up ability. This causes the monk to wait a round, then attack in the next round to at double strength. Literally M is set to M times 2. Ordinarily, this is not particularly useful, but here it would allow me to get in double power strike against Byblos before he casts armor and buffed up his physical defense. Afterwards, it would allow Solo to contract Bible's armor spell, M times 2 divided by 2, and avoid any rounding errors from Intetrim Moth. Now, I was still almost certainly going to need to grind some more levels, but it was worth a try regardless. On my first stab at this new strategy, Byblos immediately charms Solo and get in nasty hits. Well, this is going just great, I'm thinking. Once I finally got the chance to act, I give Solo the build-up command. While waiting for that, Byblos levels another physical attack causing Solo to respond with counter and deal two 300 damage hits, before Byblos can cast armor. Solo responds with his build out attack and both attack when critical, dealing over 1500 plus damage hits to kill the boss instantly. So he literally just one shot by a boss. Wow. How's the greetings on Peth? How are you doing? I was so stunned, I barely got to the screenshot. Amazing! Iblos had 3600 hit points, and Solo dealt that number in two attacks literally seconds apart. Full health to death, just like that. I wouldn't believe it if I hadn't seen it myself. One thing's for sure, the build-up skill was going to get rotated into more boss fights as a new tactic. After the Ancient Library, the next task in Final Fantasy V is to journey across the desert region, where, of course, another boss awaits. The Sandrum is also somewhat interesting because it pops back and forth between three different holes, and any attack directed at one of the holes misses. I made sure to pause and wait for the Sandrum to move before make attacking with Sola, and he never attacked the wrong target. The Sandwood's attack was rather weak, consisting of quicksand spell that did exactly 60 damage each time. Solo had plenty of hit points to cover that. He kept attacking and after enough rounds, the boss went numb. Easy fight on the whole. Finally, Solo got access to an airship. Following another boss fight, of course. This new opponent, Crayclaw, had a tail screw attack that dropped hit points to critical. Uh Sola died before I could heal him the first time I fought Crayclaw. The second attempt, the boss concentrated on physical and stacked instead, allowing Solo to counter and deal easy damage. Crayclaw had a weak defense and few hit points, only 2000, so Sola won in a mere 4 rounds of punching. The airship opens up a few extra locations in Final Fantasy V, although nothing on the order of the original Final Fantasy. The one village that offers something noteworthy is Istori, where three powerful accessories are on sale. The Flame, Coral and Angel Rings. 
The flame rings absorbs fire attacks, negates ice attacks and is weak against water attacks. This is good because there are very few water attacks in this game. The coral ring is the opposite, absorbing water and weak against lightning. Great if you choose to fight Leviathan at the end of the game. The angel ring runs very high magic defense, a must in some battles and protects against a bunch of status ailments. I wanted all three for solo. The only catch, they are a cool 150,000 gold and thus phenomenally expensive. Solo had a few expenses, saved his money all game and still was only sitting on 45,000 gold. This was another aspect of Final Fantasy V that I really like. Gold means something in this game and you have to prioritize funds carefully. On a normal playthrough, just keeping your party equipped with current weapons and armor can be a challenge. It's a far cry from most modern RPGs, where you'll always have vastly more money than needed and never have to make tough choices. Since I could only buy solo one of the three accessories at the moment, I took the flame ring, as, it would, as I would be needing it on the soonest to defend against upcoming fire and ice attacks from some bosses. It's a shame you can't get his story before the fighting Ifrit. I went back and fought Shiva now. Even though Solo could never summon her, it's fun when bosses can't hurt you. I also fought, Ra fought Ramu as well, who could hurt Solo with lightning. Although there was no point to doing this, since bosses don't give experience in Final Fantasy V. Only ability points. It was fun. And that's all that mattered. Back on the quest track. Solo next had to retrieve a Dementium from a Meteor. Don't ask. There was another mini-boss here. A giant turtle known as Adamantini. Against a purely physical boss with high attack power, Solo found himself in another giant, Slugfest. Put him in the front row, bang away and hope the other guy goes down first. I swapped out the useless flamering accessory for this fight and equipped the elf cape instead, which grants one third chance to dodge physical attacks. The cape proved its worth here, as Solo dodged about 6 or 7 attacks during the course of the fight. That was hugely important since he won for a mere 45 hit points remaining. It didn't quite react as fast. Uh, wrecked fast enough to catch the monster burning away into fog. This was a boss that could have been a roadblock, but little luck in dodging attacks carried Solo through at the first opportunity. In reprise the, of the original Final Fantasy, the final area of the first part of the game sent Solo up a floating castle in the sky. Just to get in, however, he had to fight a bunch of cannons. This was where the flame ring proved its weight in gold. These flame gun minions did nothing but shoot the fiery emission attack over and over again, which did slightly over 200 damage each time. Rather than burning Solo to a crisp, of course, the attack actually healed him. Thus a series of deadly battles that would have required multiple elixirs uses become a snooze fest, where I did nothing but hold down the attack button. As I said before, there's almost always a solution to any situation in Final Fantasy V. You just have to find it, and make sure you have the right equipment on hand. The real boss of this area, however, was Soul Cannon. This was a nasty, nasty fight. Soul Cannon has over 20,000 hit points and charges up a destructive Surge Beam that deals at equal to 50% of the max hit points. Worse, the boss is accompanied by two launchers who fire off stream of missiles attacks that simultaneously count as STEMI spells, lose 50% of your current hit points, and inflict the old status ailment. Now, Solo could deal with the damage by using a few elixirs right before the surge beam was fired, but he couldn't cope with his old status effect which slowly drops all stats down to zero, or well to one. After just a few rounds of combat, his stats would fall so low that it was impossible to do any damage against a soul cannon. There was a solution, equipping an angel ring, which protects against the old status condition. One problem, they cost 50,000 gold. Remember, 
and Solo just spent the stat sum on the flame ring, which he also needed. The only solution was to fight for a while and raise enough cash to buy the new ring. Sigh. No one ever said this variant would be easy, right? Fifty thousand gold can't be raised in a day, unfortunately. I experimented with a couple of different places to fight and found the best pickings in the regions just outside Jaco and Crescent. Battle went fast by putting Solo in the front row and having him kick monsters, which was enough to take out the weaker ones in a single blow. Until snapping the picture, I never realized how goofy the kick animation actually was. So I fought and fought and fought and eventually raised the money needed. Solo gained 6 levels in the process from 28 to 34. Angel ring in hand, Solo was immune from the aging's effect of the launches. That just meant that the fight was now possible, not that it would be easy. I tried the fight a couple of times and failed. Badly. The combination of Soul Cannon Surge Beam and the missile attacks of the launcher was decimating Solo over and over again, even if Elixir use. Remember, the Surge Beam would always do 50% of Solo's max hit point total. The missile attacks from the launchers would do 50% of the current hit point total. Use an elixir too soon and the missile hit would cut Solo's HP in half, followed by an instant death from the surge beam. Use it too late and the surge beam would kill immediately. I had to figure out the exact way to, f uh, to fight the battle. When to attack and when to use items, one round at a time through trial and error. I found it useful to, with the build-up ability again here, since it reduced the total number of attacks and made it easier to plan out a strategy. Getting a critical hit on build-up attack was also getting two crits in one, which was pretty cool when it happened. Eventually, I worked out a plan that got me through about seven rounds of combat successfully. While exploring further ahead on another scout attempt at the boss, Soul Cannon had suddenly died. I was so surprised that I couldn't get a picture again. Nuts. My guide stated that uh, Soul Cannon had 22,500 hit points, but it actually died after 15,000 damage. Perhaps a difference between SNS and later version? I certainly wasn't complaining, although Solo had uh, to use another 3 elixirs, leaving 6 remaining in stock. He was able to pass another serious roadblock and continue moving forward. So for reference, Soul Cannon actually has 22,500 hit points. However, he initiates a self-destruct sequence, as in explodes, just under 10,000 hit points, so you need to deal about 12,500 damage to the Soul Cannon. Just for people that don't know. Into the floating ruins at last. Although most of the treasure inside was garbage, Soul was able to pick up an another elixir inside. There was also an accessory that could possibly be useful, the power ring, which added 3 points to strength. That might be able to get Solo an extra attack multiplier slightly earlier, potentially helpful. Of course, like the rest of the game, the random encounters in the ruins were mere roadkill, leading up to another boss battle against a monster called Archeo Aegis. This is another interesting fight in Final Fantasy V. Is the Final Fantasy V design team really did a fantastic job. Archeo Aegis goes through no less than five different forms. The first four are attuned to different elements, wind, ice, fire and lightning, while the fifth and final form is an undead one that combines the attributes of all four. I gave Solo the mantra ability and the flame ring accessory for this fight. With the following plan, attack quickly and get through the first two forms, then pause and heal up during the fire form, I hope that would leave Solo strong enough to finish off the boss without needing to dip into the stash of elixirs. The initial stages of this plan worked as expected. Solo took a few hits, but Archeo Aegis' ice attack was completely nullified by the flame ring. Even better, the flame attacks that the boss used in the third form were absorbed completely and healed Solo back up to maximum health. Nice to see things work out the way I wanted. 
solar power through that lightning form and then unfortunately got paralyzed and took a lot of damage against the final undead one. I was one attack away from victory, but Solo was under 100 life and was going to die from the next attack. Archer Avis initiates an attack and the boss picks flame, healing back 400 plus life to Solo. Wow. Got darn lucky there. Boss picking a fire attack from the long list of possible moves. As a result, Solo won this fight on the first try and without using an elixir. So, greetings to you, Haktikal. Did we have any close calls so far? I think we had two attempts with five hits so far total. And in one of the two five hits attempts, by the way, we need six on average damage rolls. Seven with bad damage rolls. In that one attempt just recently, we had actually two misses in there with the axe attack, unfortunately. So, kind of close calls, yes. Alright, back to the game here, uh, the solo character challenge here. Actually got a picture of this one. <laughs> that essentially brought the first part of the game to a close. Well, almost. There remain three more mini-bosses to take on before moving on to the second world. These are individual encounters. No dungeons to go through and it's possible to heal up and save before each one, therefore generally not too tough. I sent Solo after the easiest one first against the Chimera Brain. This enemy uses a bunch of ice and water attacks, blaze slash aqua rake. However, Solo had enough life that he could just pound the opponent with no danger. The same basic plan worked against the next boss, Titan. I gave Solo the HP plus 20% ability for these two battles, as there was no point in using Mantra or Build Up, having more total hit points was more useful. The final battle was against the Pureboros, a nasty group of six little bomb like creatures. Each of these opponents would cast Exploder, which would deal 1500 damage and pretty much finish off Solo. Even worse, when killed, they would cast Life 2 and revive any of the Pureboros that had already been defeated. Ugh. After several false starts, I decided the best path to have Solo try kicking his way to victory. Three kicks took the three monsters in the front row, leaving the three in the back row who had been taking half damage. Solo took some hits and managed to kill them off in t two more kicks only to see them revive the first three again. More kicks followed and the front three went down, reviving the three back in the row. In the process, kicks sent some more to kill the back three and they revived the front in the second time. Finally, more kicks down the front row and the third time, and now the Purebos were out of magic points to cast life too, mercifully bringing this battle to a conclusion. Who? It was times like this when I wished for some black magic to down all the enemies at once. Alright, this is going to be the next portion, but I'm going to take a short break from reading. So, how 